Welcome this morning to another edition of the Arts in Focus series here at Purdue Community College. Our guest today is Nina Katz, a human rights activist from Memphis, Tennessee. Fifty years ago, American and British and Soviet and other allied forces discovered firsthand the horror of Nazi Germany when they liberated death camps in Germany, in Poland, in Czechoslovakia, and elsewhere. Among the inmates in these camps liberated was a teenage Polish Jew named Nina Katz. Today, she will share with you her story and that will be followed by a question and answer session afterwards. As you leave, please pick up a pamphlet which will be handed out uh, in the lobby as you depart. And for those of you students need to sign the sign-up sheets, they will be here on stage afterwards. It gives me great pleasure on behalf of Paducah Community College to welcome as our speaker today, Nina Katz. Thank you, Barry, for a lovely introduction. Good morning, everybody. It is not easy to re relive the horrors of the Nazi era. It is very difficult to dredge up all the sad memories. But perhaps my testimony will help you understand what happened there. And that will prompt you to become aware of what surrounds you. I hope that you will learn from my testimony because I am here to share a very personal experience with you. We cannot change history. What happened, happened. And the six million Jews that perished five million Gentiles, we cannot bring them back. But in their memory, we must dedicate ourselves to help create a better world, a world of justice, of equal rights for all people, regardless of color, race, or creed. Today, I would like to take you on a journey to my native land, Poland, in the year 1939, when the Nazis invaded and my whole world fell apart. I come of a rabbinical family. My people were rabbis, spiritual leaders, since the 12th century. The Bible was the book of life, the Ten Commandments, the moral code of our existence. My grandfather, the rabbi, a wise old man, used to remind me each day that I am my brother's keeper. And he used to tell me that we have a big and universal God, a God of all mankind. And love thy neighbor does not mean, because I'm Jewish, to love only Jewish people. Love thy neighbor means embrace all humanity. It was a Catholic country. They hated minorities. Schools were parochial. The priests used to come to teach religion, Catholicism. There was a Greek Orthodox child, a Lutheran child. I was the Jewish child. As the priest came in, we would leave. It separated us from the rest of the children. It was harder on me because I was not a Christian. I listened to insults each and every day. I used to come home distressed. I used to say, I'm not going back. They hate me. I hate them too. 
And my grandfather said, hate is non-existent in a Jewish vocabulary. Remember, love thy neighbor. Pity them, my child, pity them. We are the chosen people and they are jealous. The inferiority complex that the outside world tried to instill in us was balanced off with the feeling that I am special. The home provided security, love, all the support a child needed to grow up well adjusted, a happy human being. In the early fall of 1939, messengers were coming to my grandfather's home, talking about the Nazis marching. They have conquered Czechoslovakia. Soon they will come to Poland. We didn't realize what their plan was. We did not know of a final solution, a plan developed by the finest minds in Germany. At the Venza Villa, when the final solution was developed, we had 14 people sitting around the table, eight PhDs, industrialists, even some clergy. And the outcome of all that wisdom were the ovens, the death chambers. The Germans taught subjects, they forgot to teach values. My grandfather spoke to me of a God. He gave me spirituality. My father was an intellectual, a dreamer. He spoke to me of a world, a world of brotherhood, that one language would be spoken, the language of love. He gave me vision for a better world. My mother was a very quiet woman. Before the Sabbath set in, she packed the basket with food. She sent me to a poor family. She said, no one should go hungry while we are having a feast. From her, I learned to care for the poor. When the Nazis marched in, I remember distinctly a cool September morning, the 4th of September. The German tanks were rolling. We ran and hid in our homes. We barred the doors. We looked out from behind a lace curtain. We saw the Nazis raise the flag at City Hall. And the next thing we knew, they were breaking down our doors. They had no trouble identifying a Jewish home. Our Polish countrymen, the non-Jews, rejoiced in the tragedy of the Jew and pointed out our homes. They knocked down the doors. We were all driven like cattle to a sports stadium where we stayed for two days and two nights without provisions, without medication, without toilet facilities. The Sturmbandführer, the leader of the expedition, held a gun in one hand and a bottle of vodka in the other. As more he drank, the more killing went on. He was shooting at random and laughing wild. As long as I live, I will remember the screams of the innocent Shema Israel, God of Israel, have you forsaken your children? I will never forget the cruelty that I witnessed. It seemed like Mephisto, the devil, has taken over the world. The Nazi pulled the baby away from a mother's breast as she was nursing it, used it for a football, and kicked it against the wall. The baby died instantly. The mother screamed. She was shot in front of us. 
we were forced to dig ditches and bury them alive. Until this very day, I wonder, were they still breathing? Were they completely dead? By the end of the second day, we were near a railroad tracks. Trains, freight trains, were pulling up. The Sturmbahnführer, the leader of the expedition, was quite drunk at that point. He held his bottle of vodka and a baton in the other hand and decided who lives and who dies. I was 12 years old. I was the same height I am now, strong enough for slave labor. My father was 34, my mother 32. I had a sister aged seven. My scholarly grandfather, they were all considered useless. They were pushed to the other side to be sent off to Auschwitz, where they died a tragic death. I was sent off to a labor camp, Moravska Ostrava in Czechoslovakian Protectorate. When we arrived, they confiscated our personal belongings. They have shaved our head. We were given a prison uniform, cotton. It looked like an American men's pajama, stripes, a pair of clogs. No underwear, no socks. I ceased being Nina. I became a number. The number was imprinted on a piece of leather which we wore around our neck. Each time they called on us, you had to memorize the number because you no longer had a name. If you didn't memorize the number, you could get shot. Fifty inmates in a room 10 by 12 with three cuts up two people to a cat. I was tall. I was always on the upper cat. There was no way to sit up. You had to slide in sideways or you would bump your head. The nights were very cold. We were always freezing. Our ration for 24 hours out of the 24 hours, we worked 16 to 18 hours slave labor in Spinnerai factories. For this, you received a quart of water in which you could bathe or you could drink it and a slice of black bread, which had to last you for 24 hours. We marched to work on the gun Formation 10, 10, 10, 10. Imagine, we ran like a wild stampede to stand in formation. If someone stood in front of you, you became the 11th, the 11th shot. The bullets were flying each day. We were surrounded with the dead. Once again, we buried them in unmarked graves. They marched us to work on the gun. There was always a gun pointing at us. Daily beating, torture, starvation, cut off from the world, not allowed to speak with each other. This dehumanizing process went on day by day. And eventually, we didn't know what day of the week was it a holiday? We never saw daylight. When you work 18 hours, you go to work, it's dark. You return, it's dark. And the Nazis were constantly with us. When the SS women finally turned in to go to sleep, the older inmates used to ask, does the free world know that we are being held prisoner? Does anybody care? There was no crime committed. 
college students often ask, so what crime were you guilty of? The only crime we were guilty of, we were born of a different religion. This went on until 1943. In 1943, the Germans liquidated the labor camps and we were sent off to concentration camps. I found myself in Oberalstadt, in the Sudetian mountains. Beautiful scenery, we did not see the beauty. The concentration camp work detail was the same, the ration was still the same, security was much tighter. We were surrounded with barbed wires, there were machine guns in front of the gate. No one came in, no one went out. In concentration camp, there were women from all over Europe, no longer from Eastern Europe. They came from Romania, from Hungary, from France, from everywhere. Every language was spoken, and constantly one question was asked. Does the free world know? And will one of us at least survive to tell the world of this great injustice? Because if the world does not know, it will be repeated again. And innocent millions will die. Towards the end of 1945, not many of us were still alive. Out of 3,000 inmates, only 800 of us were still living. So many died of malnutrition. Typhoid and dysentery broke out. It was not unusual to wake up next to a dead corpse. We slept with them, and so did I. Once again, we buried the dead in unmarked graves. By the 5th of May, we could hear shooting from a distance. We knew that something was going on. The 7th of May, the British tanks passed by. They told us the war is over. They went a little further to open up other camp. And the Russian tanks followed and opened up the camp that I was in, Oberalstadt. They came in and officially announced, freedom is here. You can go back to your homeland. You can go any place you wish to go. And as soon as they left, the ex-Czechoslovakian underground came in. They brought SS women loaded on buses. They lined them up against the wall and told us, here, kill yourself a Nazi. They tortured you so. They deserve to die. And as weak as we were, we all wanted to kill a Nazi. There was this woman, Zelma, an SS woman, who used to pound me on my neck. I have a broken collarbone and still suffer a great deal on account of it. And she used to say, your head will roll. You go and crawl like an insect. You will not hold up your head high. But I would pick myself up and hold up my head. What else did I have but that little pride? And I was going to kill Zelma. And when I came as close as I'm with you, I stopped. And I remember the teachings of my father and my grandfather. Thou shall not kill. And I never had any regrets that I didn't kill a Nazi. My hands are clean. There is no human blood on them. And I walked away. And I was determined to go back to Poland to see who survived. And the logical assumption was, if anybody was to survive, 
naturally they return to their native country, their home. I was the only one of 60 women that were sent in from our city to survive. I was afraid to go back to a country where there was so much hate, so much anti-Semitism. I decided to go 16 kilometers to a other camp, Peterswaldau, where there were many women sent in from my city. I never made that 16 kilometer journey. I weighed 57 pounds. I looked like a skeleton covered with parchment. I was too weak. I passed out along the way. Somebody thought I was dead. They pitched me on a pile of dead bodies. Until this very day, I don't know who delivered me to the Czechoslovakian Monastery Hospital. The dead bodies were prepared on a pile to be bulldozed into a joint grave. When I walked up, I found myself in a Czechoslovakian hospital. The nuns were looking down. They wore this huge white headdress. I was sure I died and went to heaven. I haven't seen a kind face in six years. And they looked so kind, so caring. And Czechoslovakian language is very close to Polish. I could understand every word they were saying. They said she won't make it, she'll die. I couldn't move, but I could understand. The American Red Cross brought in provisions and medication. Provisions didn't do us any good. Our stomach shrunk, our throat closed up. But they hooked me up to intervenous, and 10 days later, I set up and I surprised the nuns. I said, I am hungry. And the nuns danced in the aisles. They were so happy. They said, praise the Lord. She came back from the dead. And they went and brought me a bowl of cream of wheat, which tasted like glue. I ate it. I was hungry. And then they gave me a pair of crutches. And they said, walk out to freedom. And I haven't seen daylight in six years. And as I was walking through a revolving doorway, I saw a skeleton. And I thought, mine, what an ugly creature, and it's still alive. And I turned around to see who was behind me. There was no one behind me. It was me. I had to acquaint myself with my own person. I was 12 when the war started. I was 18 when the war ended. I was determined to go back to Poland. I set out on foot. Along the way, there was a whole pilgrimage of people. We all went back to our native country. I don't know how long it took. No one had a watch, no one had a calendar. Along the way, the Czechoslovakian peasants showed a lot of kindness. They picked us up, allowed us to climb up on a wagon with bales of hay, gave us a lift. Sometimes we'd come across a stretch of railroad tracks that were not demolished. They would allow us to jump on a train. Most of the time it was on foot. We eventually came back to our native country. I came back to Sosnovets, my city, only to find out that the Poles were still hateful. Polska Armia Krajowa, the Polish National Army, was running in the streets and screaming, Jews, the Nazis didn't finish you off, we will. Three of my friends who survived the death camps died by the hands of their own countrymen. And the Russians were there. I survived Hitler. I had no intentions to live under the communists, and neither would I live among a hateful people. I had to go to freedom. I made contact with a Czechoslovakian boy whom I met after the war. He and his parents asked me to stay behind with them. They said, we are mountain people. You'll be happy among us. There's nothing out there for you. But I was determined to go back to my people. 
I had to know if anybody survived. The young man, Paul, put me in touch with the leader of the ex-Czechoslovakian underground who told me when to cross and how to cross. We were to leave before Christmas when the snow was high up to your chest. We were to wrap ourselves in white sheets. When the tower light was going in one direction, he told us how many steps to run. When the light was coming back to the other side, you fell to the ground. It was a six kilometer stretch of land. We were to give the password when we came to the gate. The password was Volnosh, which means freedom. We finally made the gate. We gave the password. They opened up the gate. They took us in. And here again, ordinary people, peasants, took us into a school building. They cooked potato soup, black bread, hot tea, gave us a bundle of straw, an army blanket, and allowed us to spend the night. And in the morning, we got a chunk of bread wrapped in a red hanky, which I still have. They gave us a few pennies to buy tea, and they put us on a train and paid for our passage. Those were total strangers. I never saw them again in my life. We arrived in Prague. We came into City Hall. We renounced our Polish citizenship. We became displaced persons. We became legal. We were given a ter temporary passport. With that passport, we could go to any place in the world. We chose to go to Germany and check into a displaced persons camp in the American zone. In the camp, I always ran after little children. I couldn't accept the fact that they killed a seven-year-old child. And every time a little girl would turn around, I realized it wasn't my sister. She would have been 13. It was six years later. The camp director, a lady from Australia, called me in one day to her office, and she said, you acting mighty strange. Why are you chasing after little children? And I told her, oh, the woman decided, you will make a wonderful social worker, and you will specialize in child welfare. And I said, well, what about school? I was only 12. She said, don't worry, I'll get you a coach. You will pass on a maturity test, which is like a GED test here. She paid. I didn't have any money. No one did. I passed. I applied at the University of Munich, where I received a scholarship. I was accepted. I specialized in child welfare. There were so many orphans left after the war. I signed a contract that I will work with orphans. And here was this total stranger who took an interest in me. She wasn't a Jewish person. And please understand, up to this point, I didn't trust anybody who wasn't Jewish. How could I? I was betrayed by the free world. I was betrayed by my own countrymen. When I received that first paycheck after I graduated, and I went to start repaying, the woman said, you owe me nothing. And I said, what about school? She said, it was a scholarship. What about room and board? She said, you worked the internship. You owe me nothing. All I ask of you, extend the helping hand to someone else. I have kept my promise. I sat down and cried a river of tears. I told myself, the whole world is not evil. The Poles were hateful, the Germans were killers. But there are good people in the world. Here was this total stranger from Australia, 
who opened a door to a whole new world for me. And then I thought of the simple Czechoslovakian people who had so little and gave so much, how kind they were. And in Poland, the church was responsible a lot for the anti-Semitism that was so prevalent for the hate toward the Jews. And here were Czechoslovakian nuns, Catholic nuns that nursed me back to health and rejoiced in my recovery. And then I thought of the soldiers who liberated me. And many gave their life so I could walk free and enjoy the good life. And so I told myself to hate, and I hated the Germans with such a passion. There's no point to hate. I wasn't brought up to hate. I was brought up to love, to nurture. And I did away with the hate. I thought I will not let Hitler win. Because to be a hateful creature would mean to allow Hitler to win. And so I turned my whole life around. After four years, we came to the United States. We arrived in Memphis. Segregation was very severe. I couldn't understand. I studied the American Constitution like one studies the Bible. I came here because I was guaranteed under the Constitution freedom of speech and worship, which meant so much to me, and equal rights. And rights were not equal. Persecution of the blacks was very severe. Memphis was not a nice place to arrive for someone like me. I remember I boarded a bus, I paid my token, there was no seat in the front, I went to sit in the back. The bus driver in a crude English, and I know it was a crude English because English is my fifth language and you pay attention to language. He told me, using a derogatory for black, term for black, he said, you cannot sit there with so-and-so. I wasn't going to sit in the front. I was determined to keep my seat in the back. But the black people begged me, lady, don't you start any trouble. And they looked frightened like we did in the concentration camps. And I knew what I need to do with my life. I got off the bus. And you see, the whole time, even in the darkest hours of my life, I have never forsaken my God. I used to argue with God. If you spared me, what am I to do with the rest of my life? Show me the way. Probably was a coincidence to somebody else. To me, God has spoken. I decided that I must commit myself to pursue justice for all people. I must awaken America and tell about what happened in Europe during the Nazi regime. It started out with prejudice, which led to discrimination, and discrimination led to total destruction. 11 million people died, 6 million Jews and 5 million Gentiles. You don't hear from the European gypsies because they were the first to go. Hitler exterminated all of the European gypsies. The witnesses of Jehovah, all the witnesses of Jehovah in Europe were sent to the ovens. The handicapped had no right to live. The mentally impaired, anybody that belonged to a union, Eventually, it was intelligentsia. You hear from the Jews, because we have a social conscience, we believe that the 11 million lives, we cannot bring them back. But in their memory, I am here to speak to you. 
They cannot speak for themselves. And someone must tell what happened there so we could learn from it and it wouldn't happen again. For me, it has been 40 some years out in the community. I have worked in every facet of the community. Illiteracy was always on top of my agenda. We Jews believe we survived because of the educational process. Education freed us. In the darkest hours, when an anti-Semite would come in and drive us out of our homes, our elders would tell us the only thing you can take with you is what's in your mind and in your heart. Education and a set of moral values. I believe that no one is free unless all of us are free. I believe that one God created all of us. I think it's sacrilegious to go to church, to go to synagogue, to go to the mosque and pray and forget the teachings of the Bible. People recite the Pledge of Allegiance. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. But those are only words. How many try to remember what the meaning of it is? I am looking out here and I see hope. I can see it in your faces. My generation was drenched through with prejudices. But you, the younger generation, you must make it better. I have traveled across the globe I have been everywhere except for New Zealand and Australia. I still intend to make that trip. And everybody wants what we have. Be proud of being an American. Maybe it's not perfect, but it's the best. Do away with prejudice. When someone next to you is of a different race or a different religion, and a bigot comes and insults that person, speak up. Tell them it's wrong. Tell them you don't agree. Because by being silent, it means that you agree. And if you are a decent human being, you cannot agree. Remember, you are close. Most of you have gone to the polls. And I see very young faces here. I understand that you are juniors in seniors high school. Soon you will be going to the polls to vote. It's not a popularity contest. Read up on the issues. Vote for a person that will represent all citizens, regardless of color, race, or creed, across the board. And by all means, Count your blessings. Respect your teachers. They'll open your mind and introduce you to a whole new world that's outside of Paducah. And respect your parents. I have been on my own since I was 12. Go home and tell your parents that you love them. You don't say it often enough. I didn't have a chance. There was no one to turn to. And it really is not funny, young lady. You don't know how lucky you are to have a home, to have a family, to have friends, a refrigerator full of food, two cars in the garage, and freedom. Cherish your freedom. And make this country the best that we can be and go out and serve your fellow men. Our children from the age of 13 worked in the community. My daughter worked in hospitals. My son worked with the park commission in summer camps. Pay your dues. Freedom does not come cheap. Don't just take up space. It will enrich your life. 
you will know that you have invested in this glorious country of ours. And maybe we are not perfect, but we are better than anybody out there, and we can be the best. I'm going to stop right now. We have a little time. We have 20 minutes for questions. I will be glad to entertain any question of personal nature or general questions. Remember, 10 years from now, the soldiers who fought for my freedom will not be around to bear witness, and we survivors, so many have died, we will not be here to answer your questions. Ask away. If you have Just a question, raise your hand, I'll bring you the mic. Uh, Ms. Katz, how do you respond to the neo-Nazi movement and the neo-Nazi propaganda that the Holocaust is a mythology created by the Jews just to attract sympathy? I'm so glad you brought that up. Only a fool would claim that the Holocaust is a Jewish hoax. It's a historical fact. There are still soldiers who fought for my freedom that are here to bear witness. And all you need to do is to go to Washington and go to the Holocaust Museum, which was erected by the American government in the most prominent place across from the Smithsonian and the Pentagon. I just visited over there. It's the closest that you can come to what the Holocaust really was like. And there is also an inscription by General Dwight Eisenhower. He was there, and he liberated the camps. And as far as the neo-Nazis go, let me tell you that in my travel across America, going on a lecture tour, conducting seminars, I have come across skinheads, the Klan, the neo-Nazis, the Aryan nation, they want to destroy the fiber of our country. They would like to create America in their own image. Can you envision an America of Archie Bunkers? Can you imagine? Um, I know that your um, parents taught you to love and not to kill, but how can you, how can you like love them, the people that, that did that? I mean, after passing such a, an experience, how was it? able for you to, to love those people and say that you don't hate them. How, how long did it take and how was it possible? How did you achieve that? You know, I was brought up in such a spiritual setting with my grandfather, a spiritual leader, a scholar, a rabbi, and my father, an intellectual, a dreamer, they filled my heart with love, with vision for a better world. You see, to continue to be a miserable human being, a hateful creature, I hated them with a passion. For about five years after the war, it nearly destroyed me. I did not like to be a hateful person. And I could not let Hitler win. I would have probably died with that hate, if not the fact that I sat down and told myself, it's a crippling to be a hateful person. You are emotionally and spiritually crippled. And Hitler would have won. I would have been a poor excuse for a human being. I told myself, I am going to be the best that I can be. I will share my Jewish legacy with the world. I will reach out to humanity. But look, I have never forgiven them. I no longer hate them, I pity them when I travel and I meet up with students, especially in the high school system, especially in Memphis. We have a lot of German exchange students. I ask them to rise. I tell them, you are not guilty of the crimes your fathers committed, but I am here to tell the truth. Of course, they feel the guilt. 
I pitied the younger generation. They had no part in it, and yet they have to live with that shame. But I have never forgiven them. There are crimes that cannot be forgiven, and I don't know if I'll ever be able to do so. I am a very happy person. I have seized every moment. I have so much to give to others. Don't you see? Hitler did not win. I feel like I'm a whole human being. And I think that it really wasn't up to me. I think that God had a purpose for my survival. Yes? My name is Norman Mills. I'm 70 years old. 50 years ago, I was in the midst of what you were talking about, and it brought back some sad memories. Um, I have some photographs that I took from the liberation of Buchenwald, and I would like to donate those to you, maybe to the Holocaust Museum. My wife and I were there last year, but we did not get to attend the museum. I think they were closed, and after the meeting is over, there's some gruesome pictures in there that would verify exactly what you said 50 years ago. Thank you so much. I would love to have the pictures that be put to good use. And I want to thank you on behalf of my husband who was in Buchenwald. You were the man responsible for his freedom. Thank you very, very much. I would just like to say God bless you. Thank you, young man. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mrs. Katz, <clears throat> excuse me, do you feel the United Nations today is playing an effective role in our world where human rights is being denied? Would you repeat the question? I'm sorry, I <laughs> don't. Uh, do you feel the United Nations today is playing an effective role in our world where human rights is being denied? You know, I have always been an activist type person. I feel that we as a world power must speak up for human rights. I think the world is still a dynamite keg. Every time you turn on TV, and if you watch CNN or PBS, you can see humanity is being slaughtered. And I don't say that our men should fight on every battlefield of every nation. But I think we, as a world power, that we must summon the world community and see that they take a stand, the neighboring countries near Bosnia-Herzegovina, What's going on over there is inexcusable. The world community must take a stand. We cannot be silent. And to accomplish that, I don't know how much good it does, but I encourage people to write letters to our senators, to our congressmen, to the White House. Speak up. This cannot go on. It must not go on. And you see, when I was in Yugoslavia, which is now, you know, divided, it, perhaps eight, ten years ago, I traveled the beautiful Adriatic Riviera, the coast of Macedonia, Montenegro, and Dalmatian. And even then, there was tremendous strife among the Christians and the Muslims. There were different cultures. Everything was different. In um, the coast of uh, Dalmatian, they spoke Slovak. I spoke Polish. We had a fantastic conversation. I could read. Everything was lit written, used the Latin alphabet. 15 miles down the coast, everything changed to Cyrillic, and it was Muslim. And there was this tremendous hate that was going on. In the name of religion, people are slaughtering each other. I encourage you to write letters to our officials and encourage them to take a stand 
and to encourage the world, the world community to stand up for human rights. Any other questions? Well, it seems everything is very clear. Uh, if there are no other questions, I would like to wind up by quoting Dr. Martin Luther King. His words make a lot of sense that we must learn to live together as brothers or we will perish together like fools. I want to wish you the best of luck. I know you will have it. I want you to be proud of being an American. I want you to take a part in what is going on in your community, in the nation. And most of all, I want you to go out and pay your dues. I work the inner city and spend more time there among the illiterate, among the hungry, the impoverished, the old, the lonely. And I live in a beautiful suburban home on a lake. I feel I live in God's paradise. But I couldn't enjoy my good life unless I would serve my fellow men. I encourage you to join me on a journey of justice on a journey of love and brotherhood. Shalom, in Hebrew, we greet ourselves, each other, shalom. I wish you peace in your life. Thank you. <laughs>